Hello everyone, my name is Rose, also known as T.A. Summers. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today is a little bit of a different video and I um, wanted to get um, something that was a little more of an overview of the type of books that I love to read and things that I um, really value in terms of my um, overall book collection. So what I wanted to do for today um, comparatively speaking to the last video that I uploaded, which was qu uh, quite a bit longer, um, is do something a little bit more short and uh, tell you all the um, overall uh, ten, top 10 books that I have in my collection, according to me, that I rank as all-time favorites. And this was inspired directly by Ashley um, at Bookish Realm, so I wanted to upload my own list um, in conjunction to um, and inspired um, by um, her video on the same subject, which I will link in the description below and also in the cards for your reference. So if you want to go watch her um, channel and her expound upon her favorite books, I'm hoping to do kind of the same thing in uh, my video. So um, basically, I am I had a little bit of trouble with this video because the fact that I read so widely and in so many different genres and age groups uh this um ended up being a much longer list when i tried to look at uh, specific try to do a top 10 list in every genre and i realized that was a bit too much of a project for me to um do so what i did was i went into my um, goodreads and i looked at my t all time favorites tab and i tried to look at books that stood the test of time for me personally in terms of books that I, I consider like both new favorites and old favorites and come up a, with a list of 10 books uh, that fit in that particular category. So what you will see in this particular video is my list of 10 books across a range of different genres that I would say have the most meaning to me in terms of the writing style, in terms of the story, in terms of what influence it had on me as a reader um, throughout the scope of my life. And some of these are older books, some of these are very new, and I wanted to provide kind of a balance uh, between the 10 of both the uh, authors, the genres, and the books, and how formative they were to me in terms of not only my experience, but also as a reader and a writer. I will make a quick note to say that these are not in any order in terms of rank that would probably be too hard in the scope of um, examining each of these uh, novels, but I'm just gonna go through them and kind of talk about how I was introduced to them and um, what kind of influence they had on me and kind of give a brief description. They won't be reviews, but they will be brief descriptions of what they're about and uh, kind of how they, uh, what I love about them so much. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So the very first book that I want to feature is Megan Abbott's Dare Me. This is one of my all-time favorite um, stories, even though this is a adult um, murder mystery suspense thriller, um, kind of a, 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 like a, a contemporary noir featuring a very flawed uh, cast of characters um, um, taking place mostly in a school setting. It revolves around the main character, Abby, who is one among uh, several um, students who are part of a cheerleading squad who are considered the queen uh, who is considered the queen bee like of um, this particular cheerleading squad along with her best friend and um, it um, starts out with um, the girls uh, encountering this new cheerleading coach and how um, magnetic she is like for for all the girls who rely to her but then a certain um, tragic event happens which draws suspicion on the group as well as the teacher and it kind of unravels all through there and Abby is the one that is um, basically questioning her loyalties and the people around her in terms of what actually happened with respect to this particular tragedy. It is a very flawed um, group of characters but I would say that this is one of those mystery suspense um, thrillers that draws you in with its uh, lyrical prose with respect to how seductive it is in terms of how it draws you in. I love the, the attention to detail with the characterization. It feels almost Shakespearean in the way that you don't know who is an ally. You don't know who um, is an, who's the enemy and you're following along with these particular characters and kind of 
having the uh, Abby's best friend kind of feel uh, feeling like um, said in my review that she feels a lot like um, the character Iago from a oh, kind of like feeding all of these different conspiracies and uh, things uh, like in the mind of the character and just you're not sure you're not sure until the very end in terms of what actually happens and the journey that it takes you on is just really well done for the writing and as well as the story itself so I loved Dare Me I have not seen the series that is um, uh, based on this book quite yet it is a, it is a series but um, I figured that like I may reread this um, within the next um, maybe couple of, either a couple of months or probably sometime next year to be able to revisit it for myself and then maybe try to see if I can watch the series but I've heard conflicting things about um, how well the series adapts on things um, based on the book but the book is so so good and it's one of my all-time favorites I think I gave it like 4.5 star or 5 out of 5 stars and this is Dare Me by Megan Abbott the next book that I want to feature is something that has been formative to me as um, both a lover of sci-fi and a writer of sci-fi and I don't have any um published um novels out yet but I've been writing like for years in terms of like and expressing a love of sci-fi and fantasy and this is one of the novels that deeply inspired me for its aesthetic for the attention to details in terms of the noir setting with futuristic details and being an inspiration for a lot of other um, works that I have followed it, followed it including Cyberpunk um, 2077, The Matrix, um, just a lot of different um, media in terms of the cyberpunk uh, field. And it, this series is probably about as old as I am. So uh, for this to be the first book in this particular trilogy, I was um, captured by um, the characterization of Case and following along in this uh, sprawling setting and with the attention to detail and the style of the writing. And it still contains one of my favorite uh, first lines of a novel, which this is Neuromancer by William Gibson. And as you can see, I have the original paperback. And, and I think this is the ace paperback version of this. I have at least three different um, copies of this novel. I have the audiobook, I have this one, and then I have a special edition um, book um, of Neuromancer. And I usually pick this up every every year, every other year to kind of reread and revisit and kind of take from it in terms of the, the inspiration for my own writing style and then also just uh, like thinking about the aesthetic. I love it and I, I'm i very much a, a cyberpunk girl. I love uh, being able to read in this particular style of um, genre and I'm readily um, looking for recommendations that are uh, basically like in the same aesthetic and the same inspiration as Neuromancer. So if you have any suggestions in terms of books that I may not have read and I'll probably dedicate a video like in terms of where my love of cyberpunk came from and what I have read and what I have um, picked up for myself in terms of what novels I love and what uh, novels didn't really work for me to kind of give you a baseline in terms of what I'm looking for but I love this novel so much and I definitely want to be able to um, write a proper review on this novel. It's hard to describe in terms of what I love it like you know how you pick up novels and you love them so much but you don't know how to s describe that love to people that's kind of how I feel about Neuromancer I think Daniel Green who um uh, 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 spearheads um F fantasy news and did a very good job of reviewing this uh, novel I feel like his review um kind of like captures some of the same um things that I love about this novel but I'm hoping to do a review, a proper review of this at some point, especially with how many times I've read it. So the next book is a little bit of a more modern favorite for me. And when I picked up this book, I did not know how good it was going to be um, when I picked it up. And definitely it lived rent free in my head uh, for several days after I finished it. And even now, as I pick it up in my and hold it in my hands, there was so much about this novel that really just transfixed me and immersed me like on through the particular journey. It 
you are a person of a certain age or if you know of this particular movie reference you will kind of get w what I'm referencing if you remember the movie with Macaulay Culkin and Elijah Wood called The Good Son where there are two boys who, um, who there was there's boys who are cousins and one of them um, comes to live with um, the, um, the boy's family and it ends up that the good son is uh, like really twisted and evil and it's kind of like a thrilling aspect in terms of the, some of the things that um, he does. He seems to be good on the surface but inside he's very morally corrupt and cruel and it basically gave me the foundation of um, kind of like seeing creepy kids in cinema in terms of how um, like you know morally messed up um, this particular kid was and Macaulay Culkin played it very well. And I thought Elijah Wood's character was also very empathetic, um, sympathetic, empathetic to follow overall in the um, spectrum of things. But to uh, put a more contemporary point on it, this book felt a lot like watching The Good Son, though from the perspective of the mother um, watching the child that she um, um, birth, uh, like gave birth to and raised become a monster and do some very questionable and evil things in the scope of this. And you just watch that kind of sm spiral the whole way through in this particular novel. And it, and the way that it captured my attention and also freaked me out was incredibly well done. This is The Push by Audrey Audrain. And that basically sums up my experience with The Push. It is an excellent novel. I, I, it's one of my um, more contemporary favorites and I would highly recommend it and I definitely say from a writing standpoint and also from a genre standpoint in terms of how thrilling it was and also in how immersive and even empathetic that it was that um, it's one of my favorites and it has inspired my, my reading as well as my writing. So that is The Push by Audrey Audrain. So interestingly enough uh, around the time that I'm filming this video, I was tagged in kind of a horror favorites tag um, that I'll be posting a video um, up a little bit later, um, like after I um, get it sequenced and be able to kind of think about each of the questions. But I would definitely say that I am a horror fan of a specific type. I love sci-fi horror. I love psychological horror. I like some types of um different horror depending on I don't go necessarily for like outright gore unless there's certain other elements that are weaved into um, the um, particular narrative like so like depending on what it is like I can do slasher horror I can do some gore uh, or body horror but it's not something that I particularly gravitate towards but if you want to talk about um, a novel that I read initially in middle um, school that has a coming of age aspect that is very dark, that has a lot of different elements to it that just made it really appealing. And it's also one of the reasons why I love creepy carnivals in um in a um in, in a horror setting. Like not not talking about clowns per se, that like it's another um issue entirely and that this is not a Stephen King's uh, just saying that that uh, to be um clear. But the way that this um, described the environment so well from one of my favorite all-time writers who unfortunately is no longer here, he gave such a coming of age element to this particular novel, describing the environment, describing the two boys who are at the forefront of this novel and their father in terms of when the dark carnival kind of comes into this town and basically um, forms the um, question uh, be careful what you wish for because it might be something that you're not expecting and the way that the villain is crafted in this novel really captured my attention just like the lyrical style of the prose the setting the characterization every part of it really had an impact on me in terms of how horror could be done and also could be done in a way that's so immersive that it stays with you for a long time so I love this as a kid I love it as an adult. I revisit this several years back um, as a reread and I still loved it even back then. But this is Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. And I love this book so much. 
it definitely influenced a lot of my reading habits and what I gravitate to and also my writing style. So I love, I sometimes like, like really want to come back to this the same way that I do Neuromancer because it, it really left a, a positive impression on me. And I love so much of this book. I also love the movie that um, is, uh, is based on this novel as well. And I have that actually here beside me. So the movie, is actually a Disney movie and this was made originally in 1983 so it definitely shows a little bit of its age but it's still a really um, dark and good um, representation of some of the events in the novel while also managing to state its own narrative. It stars Jason Robarts, it stars Pam Greer which who I was very surprised to see that was in this video um, way back when and like I sometimes um, rewatch this like to be able to re-experience it for myself. It also stars um, Jonathan Jonathan Price who plays Mr. Dark or the Illustrated Man and I would highly recommend it. If you can get your hands on this, this is worth watching after you finish reading the book. It's a good evocative experience on its own but I love the book. I love the movie. I love the aesthetics of it. I love how creepy it is but I also love the attention to detail to the characters. And so it stayed with me for many years. And to this day, I still recommend it. And um, it's still um, kind of on my all time top 10 favorites list. So the next book that I wanna feature is kind of a unique um, uh, entry in this list. And I remember reading this as a teenager around the time that it was first released. That was, one of my first experiences with a murder mystery that took place at a boarding school. And you could argue that this is a very, very strong um, and early contender in terms of the dark academia style vibe that like a lot of people see as being very popular. But I rarely hear very many people actually talk about this novel because I, and I'm not exactly sure why that is because it's very evocative of having a, um, the premise of this particular book has um, a, a woman who was a student at a um, boarding school in which a, a crime t takes place at, uh, during the time that she is a student and she returns to that particular boarding school as an adult to teach there and teach a number of students um, and, like um, Latin and like the references and the details regarding latin and like what the students are learning and things like that is so immersive and the environment is immersive and you get to know the characters extremely well and then it reaches up to a point where um the main character uh, witnesses um the spiral of events happening again when another murder takes place at the same school so it's a really a mystery suspense that takes a lot of part. A lot of people say that this took a lot of experience from, and I think um, the author would probably agree that it took a lot of experience from, um, inspiration from um, Donna Tartt's uh, The Secret History, but I actually think it does it better. I would argue that very strong, <laughs> but um, this is one of my all time favorite books. And I love the journey that this took me on. And as someone who um, was a Latin student in my, um, high school years and in, uh, a little bit in my college years, I really appreciate the level of detail that was in this novel. This is Carol Goodman's The Length of Dead Languages. And as you can see, this is the mass market paperback edition. I have two editions of this book. I have the one that's from Target that has the uh, kind of like uh, discussion questions where I, and I'm not 100% sure, sure where it is, but this is another copy that I was able to pick up for myself. and. Um, I'm hoping to be able to revisit this again at some point soon. I love this book so much. I love the writing. I love the immersion into the atmosphere. I love the attention to detail in terms of characters and how it pulled me into the subsequent story and the uh, overarching mystery and crimes that were in here. So this is The Lake of Dead Languages by Carol Goodman. This next book is one that I have not picked up in a number of years and I've wanted to based on how um, much um, this um, book series has had a renewed interest because of the TV series that is on HBO, I believe, and it's coming into its third season. But if I had to say that um, 
it's interesting because I came across um, this particular book when I was 10 years old and it was actually my twin sister who picked up this book and she has not read it to this day but I remember she took checked it out of the library because she thought the cover was beautiful and I ended up picking up the book to uh, read for myself I'm like are you gonna read this and she was like no you can read it right now and I flew through this book with how much it immersed me into the world into the characters the fact that it has a talking polar bear and you probably already know what book I'm going to say because it, this is considered a um, modern fantasy classic across a lot of for a lot of different people and for me I can't exactly remove myself from how much it influenced me because of how young I was when I read it and even like thinking about it now in terms of how Lyra Silvertongue uh, following her around and being able to be immersed in this particular ro world and what she experiences in her journey in terms of um, the uh, having the particular thing that she is searching for and uh, ends up finding and ends up um, going through to start on um, the overarching journey that eventually this um, particular series um, takes her on. So this is the first book in the His Dark Material series. This is the Golden Compass by Philip Pullman. And as you can see, this is the original cover that I was, uh, this is one of the covers that I, I, I believe this is the cover that my, um, of the version that my um, sister picked up because of how it does the detailing of the Golden Compass itself. And you can see um, kind of the environment and the world that it um, showcases from the front cover. It, <laughs> I love this series so much and it's still it's still one that's um, near and dear to my heart in terms of how it influenced me in terms of the fantasy that I picked up and also what I have um, love in terms of uh, the narrative style and the characterization and the attention to detail that is um, present in this novel. I would like to revisit this at some point but I'm not sure exactly when in the scheme of things but I definitely want to be able to revisit it for myself but it is one of my all-time favorite novels and I'm glad to have um, had the experience of reading it when I did. So I have a really unique experience with this particular book because I remember it being one of the choices that uh, was offered to me in the mix of my reading for an AP English class back when I was in high school and I remember thinking that um, there was not a lot of um, ones that like I could really choose from uh, the list, but the both the title and the background of it um, really appealed to me, and I ended up loving the overarching story that it told. It's basically magical realism, and it tells the story of a six-year-old boy who is coming of age and expected to do a lot of different things in terms of like uh, how he rationalizes a lot of like difficult events and things that he is expected to do. And his world um, uh, turns around when he meets a mysterious woman who um, is kind of socially ostracized because of what she can do and what she teaches him. And like, essentially the relationship between this woman and this boy um, provides the backdrop for this very um, clear um, cut um, coming of age um, tale that really stayed with me for many years. Um, alongside the very deep and detailed writing that uh, immersed me and compelled me from beginning to end. And I still kind of get misty eyed at the ending. Like it's, it's really one of those uh, novels that do, uh, stay with you um, over time. And I'm glad that I had the opportunity to read it. This is Bless Me Ultima by Rodolfo Anaya. And this is the newer cover version. I do have an older version of it as well, but I'm not exactly sure where it is. But I will put the old cover up on here because I remember reading that distinctly during high school and remember that particular cover. And I, I love the classic um, colors and the um, scheme of the old cover, but I also love this one because of the reference to the owl. It's, it, it's, it's really um, nice, but I, I definitely want to um, pick this up again to reread it, but I did do a full review of this novel like several years back on Goodreads and on my blog. But I think it would be a good time for me to revisit it. But I love this novel. It's one of my favorites. And I'm glad to have been able to read it when I when I did. 
So the next book I'm going to talk about, I don't actually have a physical copy of, but I do have the audio book. And if you want to talk about formative experiences in terms of how audio narrators stay with you and their particular performances do with um, respect to the reading of specific books, this is a book that was narrated by the late Lynn Thigpen, who many um, no have known like in terms of generations, like uh, she's played in a plethora of different roles. A lot of uh, people of my generation know her as the chief from Carmen San Diego, and but she has played also in a number of TV series on Broadway and things like that. So um, I remember the, one of the very first times that I heard her audio narration, and she has so few audio books that she has narrated, but she gives 110% in every performance that she has. I remember the very first time that I heard um, her narration was for the um, book uh, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry by um, Mildred B. Taylor. And so when I picked up this particular book, um, which is not a uh, middle grade YA, it's actually an adult book and it's sci-fi. It's one of the formative uh, sci-fi cl uh, fantasy classics in terms of how deeply it examines its particular issues through the eyes of this character, this very empathetic character who has a lot of things to deal with in the spectrum of the story. And it's one of those stories that really uh, stuck with me, not just because of the themes, but also the evocative way that Fig Pen narrates this particular novel. This is A Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. It's one of my all-time favorite novels. I do plan, I, I recently did a, semi-recently did a um, re-review of the first book in this series, of the Earthseed series, and um, it's, unfortunately, it was an unfinished series because um, due to, um, like, the author um, passing away, she wasn't able to fin finish the series, but two books were released in the series and they were um, wi widely regarded, widely respected. I do want to do a, a, a reading of Parable of the Talents pretty soon, but I love Parable of the Sower. It has stuck with me, and I definitely say that it's one of the novels that inspired me in terms of my reading and in terms of my writing, and I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to be able to read it. So the next book is actually more of a modern favorite for me, considering I read this more recently. And it's by an author who I have read several works from and I highly respect her work in terms of how she writes her characters in a really realistic way, in an empathetic way, and just delves into the relationship to dynamics of each of her characters. When I first picked up this um, particular novel on audiobook, it was, I, I thought it was spectacularly done by the um, two audiobook um, narrators. And when I say that Logan is me, the main um, 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 the main female character, she is definitely me. Recovery perfection is all of it in terms of how um, she deals with certain situ situations and um, the family dynamic that she has with her parents and um, having to deal with some of the expectations that are um, laid upon her. But this is a romance novel. This is an indie novel. And this... Being able to watch the dynamic between the characters of Pierre and Logan throughout this entire um, book was just such a like a, a wonderful story that completely immersed me and I was rooting for the characters in terms of all the things that they had to deal with. And it's uh, I, I wanted to highlight a romance novel that really stuck with me and this was one of the ones that um, took the top in terms of what would be my top 10 in terms of favorites. Though I would say that um, I have a lot of uh, formative favorites in the romance genre and I could make a ten, top 10 list based on that, but in terms of modern favorites, this really stuck with me. So this is Christina C. Jones's Behind the Scenes. And I uh, love that book to tears and I'm glad that I was able to uh, read it. It's not the only Christine C. Jones book that I have read and loved, but it's one of my favorites. And I had the really difficult task of trying to um, decide which one of her works to put on this top 10 list, but 
I keep coming back to it and behind the scenes is the one that takes it for me because of how I identify with the characters and how um, it stayed with me long after I finished reading it. So that's Behind the Scenes uh, by Christine C. Nunes. The very last novel that I am going to feature in terms of uh, my top 10 uh, uh, best list according to me uh, in, in terms of this video, yeah, I'm like blanking in terms of how I wanted to frame this video, but you can look at the de description and see like um, this is my overall top 10 in terms of what I'm naming for favorites. But um, this last novel is another one that I read for a school assignment back in uh, early high school. I think I was in ninth grade and I had to read it for a particular reading assignment. And I think that was the novel that kickstarted my love for gothic literature and kind of gothic suspense, uh, considering how it delves into um, the characterization of a woman whose identity is nondescript, but and as she comes into this new life in this new um, environment with her her um, husband, and um, basically uh, like. Um, in the shadow of the um, woman that he was with before and you already probably know what this novel is going to be based on the um, description I just um, said like but I remember um, this being a novel that was a favorite of mine and that st stayed with me for the atmosphere for the characterizations for the tense um, si uh, situations and the environment and the way that it immersed me in this particular um, novel has stayed with me as one of my all-time favorites. This is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. And I'm not sure where my uh, physical copy of it is, but I do have the audio book and I do have the physical book for this. I will put up a picture of the original novel that I read in high school and what it looked like. And I remember distinctly uh, reading it in, um, in school like to the point where the copy that I had was falling apart because it was so old and it was so worn and well loved but it makes sense in terms of um like you know like the appeal of it and how many people have um, read it like over the um the scheme of time and I understand the appeal of Daphne du Maurier's uh works I also love the birds and I also love uh was it my cousin Rachel I believe I, I, I've been a fan of uh, Daphne du Maurier's work for a long time, but I think Rebecca is the one that stayed with me. It was my first one and it has stayed with me for years. And that is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. So that is it for my top 10 list. And this is a relatively short video. So I, I figured that if you wanted to get a, more of a glimpse in terms of what I love to read and or what type of books that really sp spoke to me and influenced me over the time as a reader and also as a writer like these top 10 books you can't go wrong in terms of stuff I would love to know what your top 10 books are um according to you um because it I love basically reading uh, and hearing and um uh, like watching these um different top 10 lists because it gives me more of an idea in terms of how um what people value in terms of the literature that they pick up and I, I definitely think that these 10 novels um, take into consideration both modern and um, previous history in terms of the um, books that I have picked up, um, give you a clear idea in terms of what I love to read and um, that kind of thing. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the, um, and please subscribe to me and hit the notification bell if you would like to see more content like this and uh, follow anything that I upload in terms of uh, what I do here. Thank you again. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next video.